shall sing. Praise God. Please be seated. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We have lit the first candle of Advent to represent our preparation for discovering a new, a deeper awareness of Jesus in our lives and in the world. We lit the second candle to remind us of the trust which must accompany true love for God. We witness the trust in God and in one another Mary and Joseph had to draw upon, to accept the role God had for them in fulfilling his plan of salvation through the gift of God's Son, Jesus, to be our Savior. Life is filled with inconveniences. We may have our plans and be prepared for how we'd like things to be, the way we believe God wants them to be. But just when we think we have everything ready, something comes along to disturb or complicate our plans. Mary and Joseph already had a great deal to deal with in accepting their role in Jesus' birth. The response of one another, of family and friends, and the uncertainty of what lay in store for them and this child. Added to this was now the news they would have to travel on foot a long distance at a time close to Jesus' birth to comply with the government's requirement for families to register for taxation. Add to this also the concern for the preparations and hardship of the journey on Mary and the need for a place to stay while in Bethlehem. Well, this circumstance was certainly an inconvenience. We know now what they did not know until after the events unfolded, that this was too a part of God's plan. Trust is a recurring trait we must put into practice. While we must trust enough to be prepared, we must also be prepared to be flexible and change our plans as unforeseen changes pop up. We must remember that we are living in God's plans for our lives. If we trust God in the moment, we know that God will reveal God's love and grace to us in God's provision for us, just as God did with providing the stable and the means to meet the challenge in fulfilling God's will for their lives. We light this third candle to represent our trust in God's continual provision for us.
have the children come forward for our moments together. I'm glad you said that. I love church too. One of the reasons why I love church is because of you folks. You make it special. Go ahead and sit along here so they can see your lovely faces. They love to look at you. I'm kind of old and wrinkled and, you know. They like seeing you. Thank you, AJ, for reading last week. You did a wonderful job. Didn't he do a wonderful job last week? Did you hear him read? You did a great job. You know, we've been talking about the Christmas tree, and we looked at bulbs, we looked at garland, we looked at different things on the tree. We also have lights on the tree, because we know that Jesus is the light of the world. If we follow Jesus, we know that Jesus will lead us into those good things in our life. There's something else, though, that we hang up on the tree. Maybe you don't, but sometimes families hang up things on the tree, and this is one of the things they hang up. Do you hang up any of these on your tree? You do? How many of you hang up a, what are they called? Candy canes. How many of you hang up candy canes on the tree? Awesome. Awesome. I don't hang them up on the tree because Mrs. Holman has a particular thing for the tree. And if you move a bulb, she puts it right back. She knows where everything <laughs> is. And so I try to stay away from it as much as possible. I'm glad I got a busy day and I won't be home too much this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, she'll be with me. But anyways, the Christmas tree, the, the candy cane has a wonderful story behind it. Do you know that it looks like a, a shepherd's crook? Did you know that? Yeah. And you know why it looks like a shepherd's crook? Because it makes it easier to hang on the tree, doesn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. It's because we look at the Lord as our shepherd. And one of the things that the shepherd used was a shepherd's crook. You'll notice that when we light the candles a lot of times, we'll use a shepherd's crook to light the candles. It has to remind us that Jesus is our shepherd. A shepherd protects and cares for the sheep. And you know the scriptures say that we are God's sheep. So Jesus takes care of us and guides us. But there's also something else. If you hold a candy cane upside down, what is it? A J. And the J stands for? You got that right. And you know, oh, yes, it is, isn't it? Oh, I forgot I put that on there. But I didn't put it on there. Do you know why it's the color? They come in all sorts of different colors now. But originally, they came only like this. And there's a reason for that. And it was made in America. And it was made by an Indiana candy maker to tell the story as children hung the candy canes on the tree so that after they opened their gifts, they could take down a candy cane and it would remind them of Jesus, the real gift of Christmas. You see, the candy cane is made of white candy, which represents the purity of Jesus, and red too. But it's basically a white candy, and that rem reminds us of purity. There is no sin in Jesus, unlike us. We're selfish at times. All of us are. But you notice that there's red. That's true. There's red in there, isn't it? The big stripes. Usually, this one is actually has only two stripes. Well, there, oh, there it is. There's three stripes. You know why there's three stripes? The three stripes remind us that Jesus is God in the flesh. We understand there's one God, but we know God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so they represent that Jesus is, part, is God with us. What do you think the big red one might stand for? <laughs> no, not quite. It represents the blood of Jesus because Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins. So God sent his son to be able to live a pure life, the white candy, and then take our sins to the cross. Something he didn't deserve because he was pure in every single way. So as you receive yours, there's a, there's a little story that's on here for each of you. But I hope you'll read that with your family and you'll remember it on Christmas morning after you open your gifts and you unwrap your candy, you'll remember Jesus. Yes, dear. 
Well, the reason why there's two candy canes on this one is because they were different sizes than the other candy canes I have down here in the bottom. <laughs> See? So I may put two to make up for one long, one longer one. I didn't want to cheat any of you. It is. So I'd ask you to pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. He is our good shepherd. He has protected us from sin. He has provided a way that we know that we can follow you in this life. And as we follow you as the great shepherd, you'll lead us to green pastures and quiet, still waters. We know that you'll lead us back to your very loving arms. And we have nothing to fear in life because your love is with us. Help us to remember this. Even as we enjoy the other gifts we receive, help us always to remember the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, O oh God. Amen. And you may each take one, okay? But we don't open it until Christmas morning, right? Yeah, temptation, temptation. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Here's another one here. Good. You gonna take that one? Very good. Excellent. Thank you, children.
this Sunday is the third Sunday of Advent. While thinking about this Sunday, I came across a prayer which embodies the, the, the meaning of this day. Part of this prayer was, grant us the patience to live in joyful hope, to trust in your abiding presence. Open our eyes to see your healing at work in our lives that we might touch the world with tender, compassionate care. These words touched me deeply because they brought back memories of my mom. This was the way she lived her life, doing things for others. My mom went to her heavenly reward many years ago, but her spirit lives on in me. Her spirit in every day is Christmas Day. I fall short sometimes, but the faith she taught me the true meaning of, of this season, and I will be forever grateful that I had such a person as my mom in my life. I mean to give you more exercise. Would you come and share with us your prayer? Let us pray. As we celebrate this wonderful season, I quote from Luke. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Gracious God, as we celebrate the birth of your Son, let us put aside the troubles, the anger, the mistrust, and focus on the greatest gift ever bestowed on us, the gift of your son. Father, as we celebrate the birth of your son, we are aware that many people do not have the freedom to celebrate this joyous occasion. Some risk bodily harm and even death. We pray for those who risk physical harm to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. God, help us to continue to realize the wonderful gift, your son, that you gave us. Dear God, I pray that Christ be born anew in us this Christmas. This Sunday is the third Sunday in Advent, and I pray that we take the light of Christ and use it to light the darkness and share the light with all people we come in contact with. I pray that as we get involved in the wonders of this season, that we do not forget the Christmas that starts with Christ. I close with these few lines. Don't forget Jesus. Christmas is a special time to reflect on Jesus Christ. The wonder of his lowly birth bring message to our lives. There really is no other reason we celebrate this day the birth of God's precious son and the life he willingly gave. But so much seemed to distract us in the busyness of our lives. We lose our focus in all the happiness that not knowing we leave our Christ. We lose sight of the true meaning, 
we endlessly rush about trying to find that precious gift and seems to cloud us, our Savior out. We need to stop and reflect a while, remembering our gracious Lord, his birth, his life, and sacrifice, and all that he stands for. For though the world may celebrate, it seems the other reason, to keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the true meaning of the season. Thank you, Ken. May have the ushers come forward at this time for the receiving of our tithes and our offerings. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts you give to us, and the children, and the music, and in those whom we worship with. May we give of ourselves as you have given to us, that others might be blessed. In the name of Jesus, amen. God, even as the shepherds brought themselves, so we bring ourselves to you, even as the Magi of old brought gifts, so we bring our gifts. 
Our gifts are for your use. That you might, through your life, that is with us now, bless both us and the world. May it be so through your church. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My little angel next to me reminded me that I'm supposed to be able to say to you, please turn and greet one another with the peace and love of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I hadn't forgotten. earlier this week and so the scripture is a little different than what's in your bulletin. I'm going to be reading to you from Matthew chapter 6 verses 24 through 34 and although this is a familiar passage I'm reading from the message so it may not sound as familiar as sometimes. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one God you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body? Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count for far more to God than birds. Has anyone, by fussing in front of the mirror, ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields, look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color or design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think God will attend to you, take pride in you, do God's very best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. 
people who don't know God and the way God works fuss over these things. But you, you know both God and how God works. Steep your life in God reality, God provision, God initiative. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. This is the word of God. Thanks. Thank you. As we continue with exploring the Christmas Carol for 2014, we ponder these questions of faith and life. What are the signs of God's presence in your life? What anxieties do you struggle to let go of? How can you share Advent joy this week? Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, our redeemer, and our joy, now and forever. And now, dear God, either through me or in spite of me, speak the word your people need to hear. Amen. I want to share with you this morning a prayer from a book called A Heart Exposed by Stephen James, Talking to God with Nothing to Hide. Pastor Brian uh, gave me this book a while ago, and uh, when I was thinking, okay, so what can I do this morning? I turned to this. O creator of beating hearts and healer of broken ones, I've let my passion grow cold since those days when I first began my journey with you. You've become a part of my life rather than the center of it, a distraction rather than the direction. And my prayers have grown stale, stored so conveniently in the cupboard of my heart. So here's what I ask. Give me the eyes of a newborn believer Introduce yourself to me again. Amaze me with your presence and upset the comfortable balance of my numb and stable life with your strange brand of fiery grace. Crack open my courage and my awareness so that I can finally speak to you with all of my will and emotions, with heartfelt needs, and honest fumbling, instead of holding myself back and offering up these hollow little prayers. Amen. So this Sunday's sermon is now called Celebrating the Present in Christ. And I'm imagining that scripture was familiar to most of you. Yes? Are you still awake? Okay. Was it familiar? Yes? Okay. Yes, there's a few of you out there. Um, you might be more familiar with the translation that talks about, remember the lilies of the field that do not spin, nor do they sow, yet they are clothed like all of Solomon's glory or something like that. Our, um, the point of it is that God takes care of them. And in that, God encourages us not just not to worry about clothing, but about all things, not to be anxious. And that message that God is taking care of us and we need not be anxious seemed so important at this time of year. Our to-do lists seem to be getting longer and the days and the hours of sunshine seem to be getting shorter. 
and head usher Joe Sears left me a note that the time is getting short to recruit ushers for 7, 9, and 11. <laughs> and we have so many things to do before Christmas Eve. Last night, there was a parents' night out downstairs. We had 16 children and eight adults to take care of them, as some parents had a few childless hours to perhaps wrap up some pre-Christmas uh, errands. Now, that wasn't near so many as the 90 people who attended the Happy Birthday Jesus breakfast last weekend. But at both of these events, I was glad we have a very nice ratio, well within the safe sanctuaries requirements that keep children and vulnerable adults safe when they're here at Liverpool First. And I especially want to thank those who were there last night, Lori and Justin and Tim Tobias, the pizza guy, and Jan Tyler, Desiree Spicer, Marsha and Sarah, ba Sarah Bailey, and Morgan Fulmer for making that happen. Part of last night's parents' night out was watching a movie called Frozen. How about nodding if you've heard of that? <laughs> OK, many of you have heard of that, even if not the lilies of the field. Um, I didn't think of it as being as common as the scripture until I heard all 16 children, well, maybe not Zachary Bailey, um, but all of the other children joining in as soon as the music started. And my prayer for this church is that we might become as effective at surrounding our children with the stories of God's love for them and for all people, as Disney is with sharing with us the songs of Frozen. Our all-church book study, our Bible study on A Christmas Carol, um, is in its third week right now. And at some point in time, it was written in the 1830s, so I'm guessing in the 1900s, that was about as ubiquitous a Christmas story as Frozen's Ella and Anna are for kids today. But in case you haven't watched or read it recently, I'm going to summarize. So Ebenezer Scrooge, is a man who really could have benefited from today's scripture reading. His partner, Jacob Marley, who in the story died seven years ago on Christmas Eve, shared Scrooge's single focus in life, which was making money. Jacob Marley is now a ghost, and his Christmas present to his former partner is to come to Scrooge and tell him how Marley is suffering in the afterlife. Because every day he is forced to see what he could have done differently, but now is unable to change. Quoting from the novel, Marley's ghost explains it this way to Scrooge. At this rolling time of the year, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to the blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no, no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? As a Christmas present, Marley comes to give Scrooge a chance and a hope to escape the same fate. He tells Scrooge that he's going to be visited by three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past, of Christmas present, and of Christmas yet to come. And this week, we're talking about the ghost of Christmas present. And after this sermon, you'll all be caught up so any of you can come to any of the Bible studies this week. The times are in your bulletin. So we're using this story by Charles Dickens as a parable. That means that it's a story that tells us a great truth without being a story where there's a one-to-one -one mapping of this person is Jesus and this person is God. It's sort of the feeling of the story overall, the message of the story overall. And one of those key points that we take from Dickens' story is that the ability to see past, present, and future and to chart the course of our lives accordingly, based on that perception, is actually a gift from God. 
It's not a curse, although sometimes it might feel like it. As one of our book study participants lamented this week, I'm 80 years old. I'm tired of self-examination. Why do we get tired of it? Well, because we get tired of admitting that we are still not entirely the people that God has called us to be. And yet, we keep doing it because we never tire of receiving God's mercy and forgiveness. This gift of being able to receive past, present, and future is foundational to this free will that God has given us. Our lives are not predestined or predetermined, but every choice we make has a real and lasting consequence. What we do makes a difference. This is good news, great joy, even as small as we recognize we are in the grand scheme of all God's creation. Our little lives make a difference on the path of all eternity. We are invited to be a part of God's transformation of the world, not only of ourselves, but of all creation, that God's reign might be realized here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Our lives do make a difference, and our actions do have consequences. Now, some consequences we will see in this life, others won't be clear until some generations after our death. In Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, Scrooge's rehabilitation, he prefers that word rehabilitation to salvation, but they're talking about the same thing. His rehabilitation depends upon Scrooge gaining a new perspective upon his past, present, and future, and changing his behavior based upon it. And this is true for us as well. We too must work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as the Apostle Paul teaches. It requires a new perspective on what has been, what is, and what could be. And in order to get that, we go to God, because we need new eyes to see, new ears to hear. St. Ignatius taught a form of prayer called the Daily Examine, and its name doesn't hide much. It's a prayer that you do daily, and it involves examining your life. Here's how it goes. At the end of the day, after all of your nightly rituals, you've brushed your teeth and put on your PJs, whatever it is you do to get ready for bed, then you stop and take a moment to think back over your day in God's presence. You find those moments where God's presence was real to you, those moments where you felt the joy of walking with God. Those are moments of consolation, and you give thanks for them. You also bravely open your eyes and look at those places where you felt far from God, knowing that it's not God who moved away, but usually us. And you offer those also up to God, as moments of desolation, and you repent, making a conscious effort with the help of the Holy Spirit, which is the only way any of us can do it, to do differently next time. Teaching our children to do this sort of thing every day is one of the ways that we can teach them to see Christ's redeeming presence in their own lives and in the world all around them. You might see a moment of consolation in a neighbor who shoveled your driveway before you could get out there to do it. Or maybe an extension on an assignment's due date. Or an unexpected piece of mail or a phone call that wasn't asking for a vote or a contribution or a bill to be paid. Teaching our children, teaching ourselves to see these things as signs of Christ's redeeming presence in the midst of this world is a way of offering up our whole lives to God. Our Christianity is not just for Sunday mornings. 
And our faith is not just for those times when we're in a crisis. It's for the everyday ups and downs of life, too. One family I know shares highs and lows at dinner each night, which is kind of like consolations and desolations. What was the best and what was the worst thing that happened each day? And they help their children to pay attention to what is happening in their own lives and in the lives of others around the table, helping them to interpret their lives in the light of Christ's love. Clearly, we can't wait until our children are all grown up to teach them about God's love. As Tiny Tim shows us in A Christmas Carol, often the children get it before the grown-ups. Sometimes, as a college chaplain with a little bit older adolescent young adults, I would need to remind them that life is about what you're doing right now, not just about what you do after you graduate, or after you get that job you've always wanted, or after you get married, or after everything works itself out and you get through the crisis of the moment. God is with you in the presence here now. And whether that is the place that you'd hope to be in life or somewhere that looks a little different, whether that's an employment or living or health situation that you wouldn't choose if you had a choice, today's life situation is the one that you get to live today. It's the one you get to be accountable for today. And most importantly, it's the one that you get to find the joy in today. Sometimes that joy is hard to find. And sometimes it seems like we're waiting forever for something to happen, for real life to begin. That happened to our buddy Scrooge. After seeing Marley and the ghost of Christmas past, he was ready for the ghost of Christmas present. He had been convicted, and he was ready to see what came next. And so he waited. He lay in bed and just waited. Perhaps some of you can relate to that feeling. Although the ghosts in Dickens' Carol are fictional, the human anxiety of lying awake, not knowing why or what to do or how to get back to sleep is real. Or perhaps you can more easily relate to the reader or the onlooker, the one who thinks, oh, I would have known what to do. And Dickens points out a great truth. It is always easier to imagine a solution to someone else's problem than to your own. Bishop Will Willimon says that many of us sitting in churches today have relatively little trouble believing that Jesus loves us and forgives us. What we have more trouble believing is that Jesus loves and forgives other sinners too. And to that we have to read a little further just into chapter 7 where it says, Judge not that ye not be judged. It's right after today's lesson. And I notice that every time I point a finger there's those other three fingers that are pointing back at me. Advent is about waiting. Waiting with confidence. Although we know not the day or the hour, we do know the promise that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And so we wait with joy. Our pink Advent candle is for joy in the present. Joy in the midst of our daily examine. Joy in the gift of being able to see past, present, and even a little bit into the future. And with God's help, with the help not of the ghost of Christmas future, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to change our lives accordingly. We have joy in the knowledge that Christmas is not here yet. We still have a little time. And we live in the assurance that God is with us today at this moment. And this is already a part of eternity. This is not a throwaway moment. 
even if it is not exactly like you or I or Brian or any of us had planned. At the right time, in God's time, while we were yet sinners, Christ came into the world as a little baby, lived and taught as a human being, and died upon the cross, even while we were still sinners, struggling to figure out how to serve just one master. I'd invite you to pray with me, and I have another prayer from Stephen James, but first I want to share again those questions of life and faith. What are the signs that Christ is present in your life? What idols do you struggle to let go? How can you share Advent joy this week? Please join me in an attitude of prayer. God, let the world enthrall us because tedium is the language of hell. Wonder is the harmony of heaven. Jesus, you were never frantic. You never rushed. You never double parked your camel and then pushed your way to the front of the line at the market to get your Christmas shopping done before five o'clock. Sometimes, Lord, I catch myself just going through the motions and not receiving all that each moment has to offer. And I just find ways to keep myself busy all day instead of passionately pursuing you. I'm broken, Lord. I'm angry. I'm amazed. I'm lonely. I'm in awe. I'm full of joy. At times, I'm struck by what I know can only be your grace. At times, I'm shocked by what appears to be your indifference. With every step, I am continually beginning my journey again. Be with me, Lord, as I pray, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join in our closing hymn together, Joy to the World, number 246. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. Wonders of his love 
you have touched us. In the name 